community located off North This is about, it's about 15 miles to Inverness, about the same as Crystal River, Lakanto. All the roads are leading to it. But important me to keep in mind, <coughs> we find that the zip codes, a couple of them up in that area, have the greatest concentrations of need and poverty in the county. Isn't that amazing? And so when we put it that way, it's ideal. The other thing is, is it's uniquely positioned for people in the workforce who may choose to work over in uh, the western part of Marion County in those big distribution centers and stuff, which is a growing, growing, growing aspect. Many of those folks already live in Central Springs by the way, and those with school-aged children are already attending our schools. And so we feel really good about that in that some of them will be willing and qualified to become actual home owners instead of renters up there. And uh, that maybe we can provide that added bit of security to the folks that's already here. And I'll make one last point on that. We talk about all the benefits of home ownership and security and stuff. What we seldom talk about, but quite meaningful, and so we should, is the economic benefit to the community that it generates. Do you realize that our new three and four bedroom homes, the cost of ownership, is around 500 a month, including escrow for taxes and insurance. That's the payment, that's it. Well, we are told that that's about half of what the rents are right here. Mm -hmm. That being the case, just a little back of the envelope arithmetic, if I can get my classes right, would tell us that that's about $6,000 a year in savings. Now, folks, to a family making $20,000 to $24,000 a year, that's a 25% boost. What can we do with $6,000 a year? Maybe buy a decent automobile so we can get to and from work and get to get school, this, that, and, you know, those necessities like educationally go to the dentist and all these things most of us take for granted, quite frankly, $6,000 a year. And we can do that with the existing wage structure. We don't have to bring in new industry to do that, although we should. We don't have to. We can take the existing workforce, the resources we have right here in this community, and we can uh, leverage, for lack of a better word, their economic power just by providing this home ownership opportunity. And in so doing, they're paying property taxes, school taxes, and most importantly, they are now among the fewer than two-thirds of Americans that can call themselves homeowners. So we're real pleased. Now, we need your help on a couple of things. <clears throat> you folks are in a unique position to know where the needs are because you see the children and that's reflected in them when they come in the classrooms. And to the extent possible, that our teaching professionals, our paraprofessionals, our school support people can identify those kids and maybe tip their parents off or tip us off or tip somebody off here in the community as to what's available to them as a hand up. And maybe that habitat may be the answer for a few of them. And while we're talking about our support staff, who better to benefit 
from those homes that our own support staff. The people we rely on every day here, our janitors and our custodians and, you know, and the cafeteria folks, bus drivers and whatnot. And that applies to the hospitals and the county commission, not just the school board. Kindly, kindly, kindly spread the word around. Learn about Habitat. Go on that website, habitatcc.org. We have a complete orientation that explains the entire program. It's right online. Go on there. Learn about it so that you can uh, at least uh, mention to others its benefits and the general uh, requirements of the program. We need homeowners. And I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for the work that you do here in the community. And I will leave with this pledge. We will work just as hard and smart as we can to build as many homes and serve as many people as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. That is correct. One of the first homeowners of Southern Pines Village is one of our bus drivers. And uh, you know, she still remains the mayor designate over there. And uh, we're very proud of her and to have been part of that with her. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. They're, they're great people that work very, very hard. And really appreciate you coming here. Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes. Um, Mr. Russoff, once again, you, uh, you are a trendsetter. You are a remarkable. I know 25 years ago you talked about versions of this, and I, when I saw this come out, um, I said, well, this is what George has been talking about doing for many, many, many years. So uh, this is, this is going to be life-changing to so many people. Uh, I, I think one of the things, and maybe Superintendent, um, our HR, or, or with Mr. Bishop or somebody, if, if we could work with uh, Habitat and Mr. Russo to maybe do a, you know, a virtual workshop or uh, some opportunity of, of getting to our staff who we, we really want to move them into this direction and, uh, and you know, blast that out to our own staff of not just the information but maybe a, an opportunity to, to learn how they can start to, to get on this path. That would be, a, I think, a, a great step forward. So, uh, Just wonderful. Give us a holler if any ideas come up. Uh, obviously, we'd love to talk about the program, so <laughs> just call and we'll show up. And Thank Amy you. and I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. For this.
all at FRE that we chose to use, or Canvas, if you will. Um, and for those of you that know the layout, this is uh, on the way out to the first grade playground in the hallway out there. And on the right, you, uh, you can see myself and my cousin in those two pictures. And those are us creating stencils uh, for the project that we use to help create the designs and overall really organize kind of the project and our ideas and what we wanted to really create with it. And so this is the first initial working on the wall. Uh, so you can see myself and uh, Anjali Devon uh, working on the uh, wall there. And so we really tried to use a lot of the stencils to organize the wall as far as figuring out spacing uh, and what we wanted it to really look like. Uh, and here are some more pictures of us working on the wall. And so this is uh, the painting stage of the project. So uh, you can see we had many volunteers here as well, uh, helping us from both our troop and just from around the county. And so I would like to also give a thank you to all the volunteers that helped, uh, Sam Hines, Anjali, uh, Shelby, uh, and Tashar. Uh, they were all very instrumental as well in bringing this project to life, and we couldn't have done it without them. And one thing I really appreciated about this project uh, is how creative we really were able to get with it and in terms of uh, the designs we created and the methods we used to get there. Uh, so you can kind of see in the top left picture, uh, one funny thing is we, I forgot to get the key for the lights for the school. And we were working on the weekend, so we had to bring in construction lights so you can see what we were doing in there. Uh, and also other things, for instance, like the, the maze that we ended up doing. We use a projector to put the design onto the wall to stencil in because it was too big for a regular stencil. So just stuff like that was really cool and something I really appreciated about this project. Old school. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is some of the getting closer to the final results of the project. And so this is basically the, the project that is kind of final state. We're just doing the touch-ups. And so this is just a video walk through the final project. So we had several elements with this. We had mainly push and like trace elements through this to try and uh, give the kids interaction space to really kind of let their energy out and give some stimulation. And so here you can see an overview of the path. And I'll just explain a couple of the elements. So the first one we have here is a a push and a trace, and then we also have some bear claw and lily pad elements meant for them to push their hands on as they walk through the path. And then, of course, a maze for them to trace their hands through and a jumping jack to really get them kind of excited and energized at the end. And also, you can see there we have, of course, we had to include an owl being Forest Ridge. And uh, we also, that's where I have uh, my name in the wall just saying it was our My Ego project. And so this is another picture of the results. Myself and Ms. Mosley and our volunteers, of course. And these are also some other people very instrumental to this. Uh, Mr. Gear, uh, the uh, vice principal at FRE, was also helpful in creating kind of the designs and suggesting more layouts for the project. And Mr. Eppel on the far right, who uh, could not be here today, uh, it was very helpful from the scout side as far as organizing it and making sure it met all the requirements. And so that's all I had. But I just again wanted to say a great thank you to all those that helped with the project. And it would not have been possible without our volunteers and support from all the staff we had. So thank you. So at this time, I'd like to ask Mrs. Himmel, our superintendent. Um, also, 2020 Superintendent of the Year for this. So, <laughs> yeah. you didn't know that. And if you want to present. I would just like to say also, Ethan, congratulations and thank you for what you did. But I, you are a wonderful speaker and a wonderful presenter. So, great job today. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, Simmel. And Ms. Simmel, did you say the Simmel, I want to come down with you all, too. Yes, I'd like to also thank my father who is here today, who was very instrumental as well in the, in the planning and overall creation of the design, and running, running to get those lights for us as well. <laughs>
So you thank know what you. I was looking at the sun and I thought, you know, that looks like this to different businesses in the county and paint it on the businesses. Next month. And I'll say before he can leave, one of the things that we had him do is um, I kind of talked to his mom about kind of presenting and said if he wanted to do a PowerPoint. And so he was very good about getting the PowerPoint to me, making sure it worked, and have it all ready to go. So commendable on everything you've done, and I wish you luck in your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, and Mr. Johnson as well, so sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you. Scoutmaster for the truth. And he said, I'd just like to say thank you because it was Mrs. Um, McHugh that mentioned what you had done uh, as your project. And I commend you for caring about our most neediest kids and our babies. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the board, Superintendent Himmel. I'm extremely excited to be here to present our National Merit students for the class of 2021. In October of 2019, over 1.5 million juniors in 21,000 high schools entered the 2021 National Merit Scholarship Program qualifying test by taking the PSAT. Of those 1.5 million juniors, 50,000 were recognized as National Merit Commended Scholars. That's 3.5% of, of those who took the test. For the class of 2021, six students advanced to the Commended Scholar stage. Of that six, three went on to become finalists. Our Commended Scholars this year, who were unable to make it today, were Annabelle Cunningham, Eric Peterson, and Craig White. Of those 50,000 commended scholars, 15,000 went on to become National Merit finalists. In Florida, this distinction, finalist, is important because it triggers access to the Venequisto Scholarship, which pays for the cost of attendance at a university in Florida. And that would include tuition, room, food, books, computers, cell phone, clothes, and travel expenses. At the University of Florida, that's approximately $85,000. Our students who became finalists are, where did you want them to stand? Right here. Our students who became finalists are Sumat Chandrapatla, who will attend the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and be part of the Early Medical School Acceptance Program. Next, we have Anjali Devon, who, like her brother, will be attending the University of Florida.
best always, and for my dad who could not make it as well. I don't understand that. That's all we did here. <laughs> And finally, we have Sanvi Kamat, who will also attend the University of Florida. To all of our students, we are very proud of your accomplishments and we wish you the very best on all your future endeavors. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Ms. Mr. Bittner, before you leave, statistically, because you know we like data, um, on off the top of your head, with the enrollment that we have in Citrus County, about how many would would be common um, of National Merit finalists uh, would we have in Citrus County on an annual basis? Just in Citrus County? Yeah. Uh, we would average, if we talk all accommodation through finalists, we average anywhere from two to five a year. And what would be outside of Citrus County, if you looked at our numbers, what should we have if we weren't as amazing as, as our students are? Uh, that's going to be a little tougher. I mean, um, National Merit kids are going to be basically 1% of the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, the six here um, out of the thousand. Um, so we're, we should have perhaps a few more. But um, in terms of there's a lot of school districts and some of schools that don't have any and a lot. So uh, we're very proud. Every year we seem to get a few more each year. So we're very proud of all of our success. So they say it looked like we tend to, with with all the data that we have, uh, it looks like we end up getting a little more than we sometimes, uh, than some of our neighboring counties. Oh, definitely. More than our neighboring counties. <laughs> <laughs> That's really where I was going. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was, I was trying to be very careful, but, you know. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And a large part of that excellent work is due to Mr. Pitt. Here, here. And on top of it all, and thank you so much. You're welcome. And I'm glad to see the parents here because the kids could not do it if they didn't have that support at home. They need good teachers and they need good parents. Oh, good afternoon. I ask the board's approval of the instructional and support recommendations. It was quite lengthy, so I tried to send it to you a little early today. I get it. is I ask the board to approve the updated <coughs> job description for network security specialist. Move approval. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Brian, seconded by Mr. Kennedy to approve the updated job description for network security specialist. All in favor? Oh, sorry. Yes, I just, uh, I kind of want to review this um, just for information purposes, but um, it was kind of interesting on the update from this was a job description from 1998 
Is, is that right? Um, I'll have Ms. Androsky come forward, yes. Okay, I, and I just, um, you know, I, I, I see the importance for, or the, the need for this in the district, but I was just kind of curious. I didn't get a chance to see the, the prior job description, so I mean, I guess in um, over 20 years, there's been a lot of changes here, right? So can you just kind of explain to me that and why you know we didn't go with the new position? Um, I mean, I understand we, we had something similar, but can you just kind of go over it? So in essence, when we updated it to reflect the things that have changed since 1998, we needed to add in a more pertinent, for example, we have cybersecurity positions now in terminology, and we plan with that in mind, cybersecurity, and I, I don't, that wasn't a term that was commonly thought of in 1998. Um, and then as you go through the job description, just what we expect, the uh, developing a corrective action plan is important, developing a plan going forward is important, and so some of those items that we feel are essential uh, to the position weren't on the previous form, probably like, like I said, because a, a great deal has changed in the network since 1998. And just aside from infrastructure, just the way that we operate the network has changed, um, and then the threats that there are uh, are quite different than there were in 1998. So it's more making it modern and pertinent to what we expect them to do as a daily part of their role. So, um, and it, yeah, I very much agree. And I, I did get a chance to talk about some of those uh, responsibilities, um, you know, that this person will have. And obviously, with ransomware and with the attacks, uh, cyber attacks that are occurring, and, and we've already experienced one of those in the past that we fear pretty well from, right? Um, but, you know, I, I just want to make sure responsibility-wise that this position will know uh, the accountability here to protect the district and that uh, this person will be well qualified in the field, correct, cybersecurity. We're not talking about bringing someone in maybe that has no background and maybe good at computers, but but it doesn't have a background in cybersecurity. Would that be a correct statement? That is correct. That is, our goal is to, to find somebody who is well versed in cybersecurity and best practices. And so with that, um, the, I mean, the posting is gonna go, um, it's gonna be posted outside of the district. I know we talked about that, but that was, you're gonna look for a, a well-qualified candidate. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the, um, the, salary here um, and could you just go over that with us real quick as far as the compensation plan um, I don't have it written down it was do you want the base salary is that what you want um, it says it's going to it just says it's going to be consistent with the approved compensation plan um, so I, I just wanted to know what the, what position that was and where on the school the, I recall the it's base salary begins, okay. it's professional technical and the base salaries begins at 65000 Okay. And obviously you've, uh, that's a competitive salary for this position, correct? If you're working in the it's, school district, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of this, you know. Well, I won't, you know, I won't get into uh, the more specific things, but I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on the responsibilities uh, for this specialist, because a lot has changed in, in over 20 years, and I just wanted to make sure that that's a uh, priority of the board to protect our network. And, you know, I know that you moved to some other positions to, in order to be able to fund this position, correct? I mean, this is in a new position in your budget. Correct. You're right. Correct. So that's, those are the things I just wanted to, to, uh, to go. Thank you. And, and I just <coughs> echo, I think Mr. Dodd is correct to highlight those things. Those are, you know, this is a new world. <laughs> and I, I want to commend, we've been blessed, you know, Mr. Bishop, you made a lot of efforts that when we, uh, we do have something that happened, we also have a support team that's not just our own IT department, but we have a team that can come in that protects us and that uh, that addresses that. And we unfortunately have to, you know, like many districts and government agencies, have had to, to use those resources. 
I, I want to commend you, Ms. Androsky. You know, when, when I saw the qualifications, it was right on the mark of what this job and this needs because um, having a son that just went through engineering and knowing what a lot of these computer engineers are studying these days, it is completely um, and fully about, Mr. Dodd, what your concerns are. So those qualifications truly uh, you know, lend itself to this position. But Mr. Dodd, you brought up a good point, and that's about salary. Uh, it, it's, Citrus County is always going to be challenged by that at times, and uh, we're going to point at our beautiful community and the fact that you can uh, still have very low taxes and a great environment to raise your family, and, and we will point those out. But, uh, but it is a challenge always, whether it's you know Miss Swain looking up those teachers and, and going up to the cold country to find them, to, uh, to bring them here. Uh, we're we're going to always be a little bit less competitive on our wages than we would like to be. So I appreciate you trying to move and restructure to, to meet that need, but we probably do need to keep monitoring this and just make sure that we, we have that. So I'm, I'm glad, Mr. Dock, you, you pointed that out. I'm excited, though, about this. I think this is great. With the changes that are happening so much in technology, will we uh, return to the job description, uh, say, in three years and say, oh, we need a lot more? I think that's a very real possibility. I mean, we, we find out more and more every day that our staff members and our whole entire, uh, entire department need to be aware of, so I can see what you're doing that. Yes. The threats change, so we need to stay current. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. The next agenda item is I ask the board to approve the updated job description for the web-based information specialist. Move approval of the update job description for web-based information specialist. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kennedy, seconded by Mrs. Counts to approve the job updated job descriptions for web-based information specialists. Any questions? Uh, so this too was another one I just wanted to talk about because I think this also was an updated job description from what was it 2001 or yeah, 2001 um, and you know when I read through the description I looked at some things in there um, in reference to uh, the ADA compliant material and asked those questions uh, you know I, I felt like there was a need for um, consistency with our websites throughout the district, but I was not aware of the um, ADA issue. So I wanted to give uh, you know you a, a chance just to make sure that we're all on the same page with that because uh, it, it is important. So yes, the consistency of the websites is important, making sure the information is provided in a timely manner and according to statute. But in addition, we have uh, a need to provide training to to somebody that can um, understand the importance of maintaining the websites correctly. But in addition, in addition, we also need to make sure that whatever we post to the website is ADA compliant. And so that is, um, requires a, a, a good deal of knowledge on how to do so correctly and meet guidelines for that. When we post to the website, we, um, we have an action plan where we are trying to go in and correct anything that may have been posted in previous years that was not according to the American Disabilities Act standards. But and then going forward, we need to ensure that whatever is posted meets the guidelines of ADA. And so, as I said, training for understanding how to do that is uh, complex. And so we feel that if we had a webmaster that would could understand how to do so correctly and handle that for all of the sites and the district that that would be with us. Yeah, so how much of the time is this position <coughs> going to be involved with uh, those uh, ADA accessibility? I mean, what, what are we looking at? Is that just an, an initial ups, just start up for that and then that'll, once those are all in place? It, it just speaking from the HR department, we update job descriptions, we update pay schedules, we update things I'm going to tell you at least on a weekly basis two to three times a week 
that we need to send over to have to make sure it's in compliance. So I mean, there's 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 small things each time, but we have to send that over. Just speaking from the HR department, I can't speak for everybody, just our department. And that's every school needs to have their material published ADA compliant, and and, and even an image, for example, the color contrast. I mean, and it's far more than just a document. It's everything that you post needs to be compliant. I think you just and answered my question. And we are, though, under an OCR, Office of Civil Rights, findings of understanding, correct? So they we reviewed, have to make this. They reviewed our, our page, as uh, has been the case with many other school districts and uh, governmental organizations, and then gave us the items that they found that needed to be corrected or um, and that we would make, so we would be knowledgeable in the future on how to prevent adding the same errors onto the page. And, uh, and tools that we can use to actually help us identify errors. So it's, that is where we're at right now, is correcting what, we have a great deal of material, so correcting everything that's in place, but also making sure that we do not add any more errors going forward. So the resolution on the findings, we have to have a corrective action plan, is that right? On the we, sub we did submit a plan on how we would um, take, how we would correct what was already there, what steps we would put in place as far as, you know, alt tags and um, making sure that our, like I said, our contrast, our color contrast has to be compliant, things such as that. And then what we would do going forward is to make sure that we don't have additional items added that are not ADA compliant. So just- Did they give us a timeline and when we have to have that in by, or I know there's no litigation right now, right, on it. There's no litigation, just, right. but there could be, but I understand this is a, more common for a lot of other districts that have had this OCR complaint filed. Yes. All right. Yeah, I can tell you, Mr. John, sorry. Okay. There's probably, probably in the state of Florida, there's probably, out of the 67 districts, there's probably 40 mm -hmm. that have had the same letter. Uh, nationwide, there's probably 10,000 school districts that have, you know, gotten a, a, a letter from the OCR regarding all of that. So it's, it's not, they didn't single Citrus County out. It was a mass thing. We've but already we already entered into a resolution agreement with them, telling them and they've approved it. You know how to fix what we did and 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 to how we are going to correct things and move forward. And if I recall, Mr. Bradshaw, government agencies almost across the board. This is this is part of a movement Correct. to and and it's well intended to improve. You know the. Uh, the ADA compliance, but also to improve that people with various disabilities have that. But Citrus County, I don't think is not only not unique, we are one of, as you said, thousands and thousands across, you know, the, the nation that this is happening. OCR cast a big net when they did that. So, you know. So the complaint came with all these counties or was it an individual complaint on Citrus County? I mean, it was an individual complaint it, it was, what I think had happened is that, um, and like an ADA litigation, a lot of times what happens, you'll have someone that will um, go and test something, and I've represented outside of the school district some people, you know, where, uh, you know, they, um, they get sued over the ADA, you know, and it's one person who just goes down the list, you know, of through things, including like ramps, you know, ramps into buildings and what and whatever it is. So they had someone complain about just a mass amount, probably a group that did it. But they won't tell you they're going to At least at this time. Yeah. Ms. Androsky, I know that um, with this, and I'm, I'm glad you bring the position forward, uh, when it comes to things, you know, it's not just our websites. Um, our websites are part of it, but where the challenge also becomes is it's it, the compliance doesn't end at our websites. Uh, that may be where there was yeah, some pointing out to, but I know districts have talked about the, the challenges we've got. Uh, our learning management systems, teaching our, our our teachers how they have to now convert a document to an OCR document, naming of a photo so that it has a description or a minute you know, so that you can describe that, okay, it's not just Mr. Bradshaw and me in a photo, but that, I mean that it doesn't just say IMG1234, but it says Mr. Bradshaw and I are in a photo. That's an enormous <coughs> undertaking 
for any size district, but especially one that's our size that's small. So this is this may not be perfect, but it's a start for sure. And I'm glad that you're you're bringing it forward. Well, even with videos, I guess we have to have mm -hmm. closed captioning on videos, right? So all of these videos that we have out there, there's, this person's going to be working on making sure that <coughs> closed captioning. Would that be a fair statement? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. We'll need to even, for example, if you post a link, the, the way you post the link in the in the 2001, you would just copy the link URL, paste it. In. Well, that is no longer the way that we do that. That is not ADA compliant. So it, it, it's a um, it's a lot, as Mr. Kennedy alluded to, how we create our documents. We need um, so probably this person also not probably definitely this person also will work to train those of us who create documents that get posted so that we can have a better idea of how to make it ADA compliant when we create the document. It's good that you pointed out the date, too, because in 2004, it's perfectly fine. It was really <coughs> but now, everything's changed, and so that's the we have to change with it. And next year, probably the same thing will occur. And if Kennedy wants to say, hey, this needs to be changed, because it does, because there's a new rule, a new federal rule that says this is the way it's going to be. And when they say the federal I know some not-for-profits, ones that actually are very connected to our school district, um, have been actually utilizing some of our students. Two of them actually were IB students uh, last year. They were high school students, and for volunteer hours, they had learned the, the ADA-compliant OCR, and they were using that to help these not-for-profits because they were getting complaints and saying, you're not in compliance. And while they may not be under the same federal obligation, they felt you know, obligated because they're serving a lot of the same people. So, I mean, I'm grateful that we even have our high school students that are getting involved in helping us get where we need to go. Well, you know, I was really hoping that this position, though, would be focused more on the side of getting our websites consistent. I understand the need for ADA compliance. But I also, you know, hope that we can, uh, I guess this person, instead of having all these school-based people, uh, I guess there's going to be some coordination there. Would that be fair to say? Correct. So, it, and it, they go hand in hand. So when the content's added, which the, this person would do, they would add the content. They'll make sure that it is also ADA compliant at that time. But yes, they will work with the schools to make sure we have more consistency, um, to make sure the information is current on all of the sites, which is very much needed. So yes. All that will occur. All right. Well, I mean, I that's what I, I see those needs for sure. I guess I just, you know, for me as a board member, when there's an OCR complaint, I'd like to see it. I know I've asked you for it. You're gonna give us give me a copy, but you know, I just I just want to make sure that you know I'd like to see those findings so that I can have a knowledge base here. I mean, had I not gone into this job description about what we're doing at the websites, I wouldn't have known about all this. So I just you know, it, it's important that. We're on the same page. I, I don't have a problem with it. I know we have to move in this direction, but I just, um, you know, that's important to me. Sorry, No, I'm glad y'all brought, brought all of that stuff up because things are changing so fast. And so I've kept in view during this meeting with microphones, you're basically here, there, me, back and forth. <laughs> And I know you're focused on the classroom, so respectfully we understand why. <laughs> By the board is and the boardroom is not as is a priority. It shouldn't be. We want it to be in the classroom. It was on the consent agenda though. It was on the consent agenda. It was on the consent agenda. Right? We approved okay. that. Today. All in favor? Aye. Yes, ma'am. Um, point of order, um, is, would it be possible to take number H first? Yes. And if so, I'll, I'd be happy to, uh, and I'm not, I'm not joking, and I'd be happy to, uh, to hand that over to Mr. Dodd if he'd like to make that motion. 
Yeah. So, uh, no, number eight. Number eight is the. Uh, we did a notice of repealing policy 3.232 for face covering our our mask policy. Um, the reason that the having the meeting today is to meet the 28 day um, publication requirement. That's why y'all did the board meeting from last Tuesday to today. So, um, all right, we'll do number H first. All right, I'll make a motion that we repeal policy 3.232 face coverings effective immediately. Wait, we need a second. Oh, I'm sorry. I need my, I was second, gonna say. Second, sorry. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> and now we want in the public would like to make a comment on H. I see a lot of people that are grabbing at their masks, <laughs> ready for us to do it. Um, if I can just click at point of clarification, this will be effective immediately yes. upon us voting? Yes. Immediately, people with masks. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 5-0. <laughs> Mr. Bonomo, that one definitely needs to come off. Yeah. <laughs> we actually did it. We should have called it the Brenda Bonomo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then that was to A, I guess. Okay. Um, a is to approve and adopt policy 2.70 prohibiting discrimination, including sexual and other forms of harassment. Um, it's just an update to our previous policy. We had the board uh, approved for advertising at the previous meeting. The motion? Move approval to adopt policy 2.70 prohibiting discrimination, including sexual and other forms of harassment. Second. Second. Okay. <coughs> moved by this count, second by Mr. Bryant to approve and adopt the policy 2.70 prohibiting discrimination, including sexual and other forms of harassment. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Oh, question? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to ask the public. Excuse me. Anyone want to make a comment from the public? Any hand? Anyone want to make a comment from the public? And third public, we have to do this three times, so any a third, third time, time anyone to want to make a comment from the public? Okay, seeing none, then take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 5 0. Thank you. Next would be to approve the repealing of policy 5.325, teen dating, violence, or abuse. Um, because we see at the bottom of the Well, okay, we can do that one. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Next would be, I, I'm counting in my head, third one down. So uh, Next would be the approve the adopt the policy 5.321, bullying and harassment. Move approval. Second. It's been moved by Mrs. Bryant, seconded by Mrs. Counts, to approve the, uh, our DOT policy 5.321 bullying and harassment. Anyone from the, from the audience, from the public, like to make a comment? Any, anyone from the public like to make a comment? Third and last call, comment by the public? Okay. Hearing none, we'll vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 5 0. Thank you. And just, just for everyone's, you know, uh, knowledge, all of these are statutory changes that have occurred that we need to, that we need to update these policies. So the next is the repeal of policy 5.325, teen dating, violence, and abuse, um, which was uh, uh, approved because the, we're bringing forward uh, on the next item a complete rewrite of our uh, dating, violence, and abuse for statute. And just for clarification, we can keep the same number um, yes. for that. So we're repealing, but then it'll go away. It'll be it'll be its correct um, in the record, but we're going to adopt it. We'll adopt it again. The same number, yes, sir. Do I have a motion? Second. I'll make a motion that we approve repealing policy 5.325, teen dating, violence, or abuse. Second. It's been moved by Mr. John. Second. To approve repealing policy 5.325, teen dating, violence, or abuse. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear what uh, what you said, Wes, about it. Why are we repealing it? We have a, the next item is a complete rewrite of the okay, policy. Gotcha, gotcha. Yes, okay, right. thank you. Anyone from the audience like to make a comment? Second request from the audience. 
final request to the audience. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 5-0. Thank you. Next would be to approve and adopt policy three, uh, excuse me, 5.325, dating, violence, and abuse, which was a complete rewrite of the previous policy. Move approval. Second. Uh, moved by Mrs. Price, second by who second? Mrs. Dodd, to approve the policy 5.325, dating, violence, and abuse. Anyone from the audience want to make a comment? Comment from the audience? I'm saying like that. I'm so, it's so wrong we keep saying this one. Okay, uh, third time if you want from the audience. Uh, let's vote then. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 5 0. Thank you. Next would be to approve or adopt policy 8.50 school construction bids. And this was to add the paragraph in there regarding the. Go back to the. Go back to the. We pulled that. We pulled that. Okay. He was, he was, he was, he was pulled. The reason he was pulled is because the legislature just passed, let, um, like, uh, updated the law on that. Um, the old statute stated that uh, principals shall notify parents before the involuntary examination. Um, but they changed it to must make reasonable attempts to notify the parents and defines what reason, a reasonable attempt is. So it'll get rewritten and brought back to you okay. at, at, at a future board meeting to approve for uh, uh, publication. So, so it's the approver dot policy 8.5 of the school construction bids and that was to add the e-verify language. Move to approve and adopt policy 8.50 school construction bids. Second. Been moved by this count, second by Mr. Kennedy, uh, to uh, approve and adopt policy 8.50 school construction bids. Being up to the audience, I'd like to have a comment. Second call for the audience. Final call, third call for the audience. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 5 0. Thank you. Next would be to approve and adopt policy 8.502 pre qualification of contractors for educational facilities construction and that was to add the UP verify language to the policy. Move approval and adoption of policy 8.502 pre qualifications of contractors for educational facilities construction. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kennedy, second by Mr. Dodd to approve and adopt policy 8.502 pre qualifications of contractors for education. Just again for clarification on um, the repeal of the face coverings, why it took so long was because we had to go through the required statutorial rulemaking, which right. required a 28-day notice. Right. So we could not have repealed this any sooner than we would have liked to, even though we would have liked to. Correct. Right. <laughs> right. The law is clear to, to adopt, amend, or revoke. You have to go through the rulemaking process. Thank you. Good afternoon again. I ask the board to approve the appointment of the administrative personnel for the 2021-2022 school year. Oh, I'm sorry. Close, uh, I, close oh, I apologize. Thanks. Thank you for reminding me. I move approval. Second. Okay, so moved by Mrs. Bryan, second by uh, Mrs. Counts uh, for approval of, and would you restate what we're approving? the administrative personnel list for the 2021-2022 school year. Okay, thank you. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> to all of the appointees. Thank you. And we're going to take a short break. About <laughs> 10 minutes. Wait a minute. We will. Thank you. A 10 minute break. Hi, I'm so glad you're doing that. Oh, yeah. Yes. I would like to request the board's approval on a public consulting group agreement. 
Um, this is going to be used for behavioral threat assessments, threat to harm others, or threats to harm self. Um, I provided to the board, and I'll also send it to Ms. Adele, um, just a little, some information on this, but then I also have just a couple of slides I can go through just to provide the board um, some additional information on this. So again, this is public consulting group, and the product is actually called EdPlan. It's an internet-based uh, management system. It's basically for our school threat assessment teams to use when they're documenting, um, communicating. It's live, real-time, so they'll be able to look at open assessments, closed assessments. Um, and this, again, is for threats to harm self and threats to harm others. And I'll show you a little bit of that process, too, so you can better understand. Just to be clear, this is not changing the way that we handle these. We are using the state approved systems. Um, the first one is the CSAG, Dr. Cornell's model, and that's the behavioral threat assessments to threat, threats to harm others. And for threats to harm self, we use the Columbia suicide, so that's also part of our policy as well. So again, not, not you know, nothing, nothing new, they're currently used. It's just changing the paper-based system to an internet, internet system. And currently, there are three other districts in Florida that use this. Not really high reviews from those districts as well. The cost the first year is a little bit higher for implementation because of the setup and configuration of PD. So it's a little over $29,000. But years two and three will be a little over $18,000 each for that annual subscription. So how the process works is that when the school threat assessment team learns of a threat to self or others, they'll be asked some initial information, which will be the same, so basically student demographics. Um, they call, call that the intake form. And then you can see it branches off into either threats to harm others or threats to harm self, and that will change the questions that the teams are asking and the interviews they conduct. So again, it starts the same, but then branches off based on um, what type of threat it is. This will just give you an idea of what the dashboard will look like. At the district level, we'll have access to that. Chief Vincent will as well. And then each school will have access to their own um, school data. So that is an example of what a dashboard will look like. Okay. Um, this is what the, the dashboard will look like for an individual student or for an individual school. So they can see their finalized assessments as the dates, monitoring plans, just a really um, nice way for them to document. And here's just some examples. I just wanted to be sure that, that the board was aware that we're not changing the process that we're using. So these should look very familiar to you. The format will look different, of course, but the questions should look very um, similar because they're the same models that we're currently using in the state of Florida and in our district. And with that, I know you have that up uh, with some of the questions. They're the same, it's a C-STAG, it's the required right. uh, document. But, so we're going to make sure everything is checked, right? There's all the questions. Yes. Right? I, I specifically put up this one where, right. where you Thank see you. that where it says required. Yes. As a district, we can choose what fields are required and which ones are not. Okay. So within the tool, you'll know that some there are some optional fields and there's those required fields. We'll make sure to have the ones that are required checked that way. Um, they also give us some customization with um, safety plans or monitoring plans so we can add things like, for example, if we have a substantive threat, um, the principals should be notified, the student services, our department, and then also the police chief. And that's not, of course, on um, law enforcement as well, but it's not on the original CSAG model. It's something we added to our district. And there was a question, so I reached out to our contact, there was a question about previous threat assessments. Of course, this is gonna be new this year, so we won't have the, this um, internet-based system for the previous years, but they can build us a field where we can import that data so that under the student, you would have the dates of the threat, the results, and then we'll have the hard copies of the threats in their cumulative file. So we can historically go back and do that, which will be nice for the school teams to have as we're moving into this new system. And if a new student moves into the district that has a threat assessment on an, at another district, we could do the same. We could do the same thing, correct. Okay, so we'll have the hard copy of the cumulative file, and then the information would be in the system. Right. <laughs> so um, really, we're we're very excited about this. Um, I I think you you see some of the board does see some of um, you know the threat assessments, and so really that consistency with like you had mentioned everything being filled out accurately. Um, that the consistent process, um, we're looking at real-time management, it even sends alerts. So if we start a new threat, 
know, we can choose who gets those alerts and services to get them. Um, Chief Vincent, so we can set that up and personalize it for our district. Um, again, it's following the state model. And that monitoring plan, we thought that was very important. So schools have a very good way of going in and reviewing their monitoring plans and making adjustments as needed. And this is, and this is all that information that's going to be shared as our students transfer from county to county or state to state? Yes. So we, it won't be transferred through this system, but it's something that we can go and put those records in after. That's all I had. Sure. <coughs> I noticed when we were down in uh, Tampa last week with the Florida School Board Association, and there was a discussion about what, what you're discussing. And but the answers were different. One school uh, system would say, well, what we do, we first go to the principal and uh, notify. <coughs> they would say, no, we go to the SRO. And, and there were several answers to the same question. I was amazed that, that it, there would be that different. So. Right, right. And principals do share that information with their school teams. If they're hearing any threats, they are to report. And um, the members of the threat assessment team are known, so that is something that we share with schools. Um, the reality is, if we want it to be reported to any of the members of the threat assessment team to follow up on, I mean, that's the, the most important. So if the principal is not available, that's fine. There's several of their team members on our campus. Okay. So I appreciate that. So with that, too, our, um, you know, if we focus on the suicide model here, or suicide prevention, right, we're getting gathering information on students, and that's going to go into this system. Yes. And so I guess my question is, how are we going to use the system to help get services to kids? I mean, if we're tracking, which we need to, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we're using a model uh, that's a comprehensive model that, you know, is going to be available, and we're going to have, be able to pull up past history. You know, what are we doing? Um, how are we using the data to improve our services? Well, I think it's all in that safety plan or the monitoring plan. So now they'll have those interventions will be put into this plan, and you can assign notifications out to the team members. So say, for example, there's a, a school social worker is going to provide some services. They can get notification and be able to begin those services immediately for that student. And also, when the threat assessment teams are reviewing their previous threats, they'll be able to sit down and say, okay, this month these were our threats, or these were our threats to um, harm others, or threats to harm self. What are the interventions? Who's you know making sure that 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 they're following following up on that? So will the social worker enter like information into the system on that child? They'll enter it as far as that they're providing the service to, to acknowledge that that it's being provided, but not like their their notes or anything like that. They keep separate log, <clears throat> logs for that. So their notes are not going to go in this system, but they're still going to be keeping their notes, right? And, yes. But they will document their involvement. So let's say we have a kid, a child who's um, low risk of suicide, made some comments, did not get bay corrected. Mm -hmm. We're still going to use this, this Correct. model, right? Yes, okay. because so it's this. using our tool to be able to make that determination and then add the follow-up thing. Because there still may be a follow-up thing with that low risk. There right, that's, mm -hmm. yes. So how, how does the notifications, I guess, ensure there's follow-up? I mean, if it's sending notifications to people, they're required to go in and and, and right, and if they're not, Comment. yeah, well, if they're not part of that initial assessment, say it is somebody like the social worker, like we're talking about, and they're not part of the original assessment, then they would be coming in, receive notification that counseling services, for example, um, should be given, and then they're tracking that when it's reviewed monthly by those threat assessment teams, or making sure that principals, those team members, are making sure that services are being provided. And if it's external, then that's tracked in our student services department, and we have you know monthly checks in with our different agencies on the referrals that we make and who's receiving services. But our external referrals aren't going to be in the system. Is that is we can make a notation okay. that we are making an external referral, then they, they have individual okay. referral forms. OK, so it's still going to be in Skyward. The Q folder, the information is still going to be documented. Yeah, the actual threat. Once this tool is done and their threat the um, assessment is finalized, they'll still print that because that's still part of their student records. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds to me like it's it's a good plan. I, I just I haven't seen it. I appreciate you putting the PowerPoint together so we can see that. But this is a critical piece. These behavioral threat assessments, we've got to stay on top of that. So in that regard, I mean, I'm glad that we've got an online system. And I just you know I know this says professional development. So I guess it's not just training them in how to use the system, but there's other 
develop, right? Yeah, so that training will be done by myself and Chief Vincent, and then eventually when we, when the state opens more opportunities to train trainers, then we'll have um, more staff trained. But currently I can train in the CSTAG model, and so I train new, new team members and then annual right. So, you know, we, we talk about the safe school assessment tool, we talk about a just check the box type thing. It's not a check the box. This isn't going to be a check the box. No. It's going to be a, a system that's going to allow us to better serve a child who is having issues right. that needs to be addressed. And I just, I want to make sure that, you know, that's the attitude that we use for this. It's not just checking the boxes and now we're done. It's, it's checking the boxes and now we're getting more services to a child. And I think the timeliness with that as well. I think this will help us with that timeliness, especially if it's something that right. Chief Vincent does need to be involved in. He can receive notification much quicker. Mm -hmm. So do you need to vote? No. <laughs> do we put a motion on yeah, No, we haven't yet. Do we have one coming? We move approval of uh, Public Consultant Group Incorporated Agreement. Second. It's a given to us by Mr. Thomas Kennedy, put the right words here, uh, as a person, and Ms. Ginger Bryan as a second, to approve the Public Consulting Group Incorporated Agreement. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries by zero. Thank you. Next, we hit, yeah, next, in fact, the sodium. Okay. The symbol. Just the symbol. <laughs> Filling in. <laughs> um, Casey, would you like to, I like to talk about people when they can stand up in front. <laughs> As Casey's coming up, um, Sodium Fishing Gear was recognized for the Commissioner's Business Recognition Award. And a little bit about Sodium. For many years, Sodium Fishing Gear has supported education in Citrus County. For the past several years, Sodium Fishing Gear has become a true champion for not only education, but the future of our youth in Citrus County. Through their unwavering support, both financially and physically, we have been able to accomplish one of our most impactful programs <coughs> for all fifth grade students, book, line, and thinkers. This collaboration and community engagement is crucial in preparing our students for career pathway in Citrus County. Not only did Sodium Fishing Gear become a champion pre-COVID, but when the pandemic hit, they became the local business to establish a life line supporting families in Citrus County by providing coolers, funding, physically being present to prepare meals and secure resources for our most at-risk families. Sodium Fishing Gear is more than just a partner for the good. They are faithfully here during the bad times. When tragedy strikes, Sodium Fishing Gear is always the cornerstone of support. Sodium Fishing Gear is much more to this community than fishing gears and poles. They are a pillar of strength, love, and service to others. And when I refer to sodium fishing gear, I'm referring to Casey and Katie, because they are certainly the epitome of commitment in bringing positive change and implementing bold, innovative approaches to improve the academic performance of students in not only Citrus County, but <coughs> Florida, and improving the overall lives of children in our Citrus County <coughs> School District community and state. When I heard that sodium was getting, of course, I had to call commissioners up in Tallahassee. <laughs> And I said, it's about time you all got this right. <laughs> um, and they were expecting a call. But not only did they win the number one recognition for the state, um, they beat out Tampa Bay Bucks and the Miami Dolphins. So right. wow. they got to say, congratulations. I do have a little beef with you because my husband bought the fishing pole. And now he thinks I want to fish all the time, which I don't. Um, because the fish don't like the radio and the boom boxes and all that out there. But thank you for what you do for us, for Citrus County. You all are truly um, true partners. And I don't know that you will ever know how many thousands of kids you all impact, and we thank you for that. You're here. So, thank you. You're here. so I know that when they won the award, um, we were given $5,000. Casey gives the money, and then he wins, and then they have to write us a check for $5,000 from the state. So thank you for that. But this is just um, a small certificate that you truly make a difference for our kids in Citrus County. Thank you. I'll that. Hang it up if I were you, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> Casey, Casey, I wonder, by the way, if you could answer this, and I know you don't do it for this, but I just want to ask this now. I can't where are you located? 
for anyone who might be interested. On Highway 44. And for those that also look at us online, because we've got a lot of online people, where would they find you online? At what website? SodiumUSA.com. Here, here. <laughs> Please patronize yeah. them because they take care of our kids. And we just love it. You know, we love giving back to this community because we know it stays here and it goes to good use. And we couldn't do it without this lady right here. Here, here. She's, she's <laughs> awesome. Okay, so you want to present this? Sure do. <coughs> she asked me to make this out to her, but I did. <laughs> she deserves it, too. She calls everybody a hot mess, but she's a hot mess. <laughs> That's right. I am a hot mess. Okay. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. Casey, I want to tell you, um, I noticed that the Education Foundation and, uh, and all of the, a lot of the auction items, not a lot, several of the auction items came from you guys, and uh, we really appreciate that. I got, to, I bought one of these auction items. Uh, went on a fishing trip, and Captain James Curler. Oh, he's awesome. And uh, you know, he really had a lot of great things to say about you, and I, I think maybe you actually paid that you were donated the trip. I don't know, but I, I mean, I. You know, but it was a good time, but uh, I think there's a lot of people in this community on the, you know, in Home Assassin and Chris Drew have a lot of respect for your business, so we appreciate your, thank you, your help with the Education yeah. Foundation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Are you next? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon again. about two quick things, uh, USA Test Prep, and then um, what we did for our Special Academic Program Outreach. As you may remember, USA Test Prep was what we ended up purchasing last year when we had to uh, check for COVID slide and have some tool available for progress monitoring. And we were very impressed with it. I just have a quick slide on, on what we've done and, and where we are, and then a couple interesting anecdotes. But at the high school, you can see over almost 80,000 um, assessments were given. At the middle school, almost uh, 400 and almost 500,000 were given. And that was data back from April 9th when we started talking about whether or not we should renew USA Test Prep. And then you can see the most subjects uh, are used at the high school level and at the middle school level. Um, the middle school numbers are, are higher because they had more familiarity with the USA Test Prep. But when we were at the uh, principal's meeting on Thursday, all three principals from the high school said they wanted to continue USA Test Prep. Uh, especially in ELA and in math uh, and biology because they felt that their teachers found the worth and the benefit so much for it. Um, and so we ended up, um, each high school is $9,950 for it, and that's for when we have AES, and then each middle school is also is $6,950. Um, but after some negotiation with USA Test Prep, they were not going to charge us for press, so that saved us seventeen thousand dollars. So we're at sixty-seven thousand six hundred to renew the license for USA Test Prep. Any question? I just have to say, as a, uh, I occasionally will run something by my wife when it comes to to certain things. This being one of them, because I know she uses it. And I said something about what would happen if you lose USA Test Prep, and her face dropped. Um, she is an ELA teacher in ninth and 10th grade, and she says, well, then you better have something real good to replace it with real fast, because um, we depend on it, and it really is a valuable tool in our box. It really is, and it gives teachers immediate feedback on what they can do to improve. And I'll, I'll piggyback, Tom, because I've got a seventh grade science teacher in my family, here, and here. she loves it, and the kids like it. They, they got that immediate feedback and they improved every time they did this. So I think that, that we said progress monitoring, but those kids were taking those scores and seeing themselves be more successful every time they took it. So they were anxious to take it. Once you get some success, it yes. improves itself. It does. Yeah, so yeah. 
I couldn't go home if we didn't approve it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions with the USA test press? Is this on our consent or do we need to make a motion? No, it's just you need a motion. You need to make a motion. It's only information. Yeah. No, that was yeah, just information. It was just information. Yeah, okay. because it, it's on the consent agenda. I just, that's what I just tied this in yeah. with. That's what I thought, but I, that's what I was checking. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, thanks. Second, uh, we wanted to talk briefly about our outreach for special academic programs. Um, you can see this is what we'll call the five academic special academic programs we have in our county. Uh, I realize there's dual enrollment uh, and there's WTC and some other things, uh, but these are gonna be where we reach out to kids when they're in eighth grade to begin that process. I'd like to give a huge thank you to all the special academic program coordinators who helped, Mr. Switek at Citrus, this is Ms. Hannah Healy at AES, Mrs. Price from IB, uh, Mrs. Spratt and Mr. Brown worked together at the Cantor School of the Arts, and then Mrs. Doherty and Mrs. Shank for the Academy of Health Careers. They went above and beyond um, to change things midstream, to work around all the restrictions COVID was presenting us. Here's what our timeline was and where we started. Back in August to December of 2020, we had anticipated being able to do it normally like we did in the past. We were going to visit all four middle schools, talk to the students. We would have parents be able to come to all three high schools and reach out to them. And then we would promote it on district social media. In late December of 2020, uh, when we had that pandemic spike, if you recall, it was decided that it was safest for everyone if we did not meet in person because it was such a severe spike at that point. So I called all those coordinators you saw together and they created videos that could be played at all the middle schools. We held two night webinars for parents to be able to join us and learn more about the programs. Uh, and then Mrs. Blair, as always, did a great job with district social media and call outs. Finally, the applications, we had them apply through their iPad. It was right on the student iPad. They had a QR code they could use if they wanted to, uh, and it was also available through social media. And here were the results. The total applications for the five programs are as you see. The total enrollment for uh, computer science is gonna be 74 going into next year. AES is 66, Health Careers is 81, IB is 90, and Lacanta School of Art is 50. Below that, you have the historical range of how many were accepted each year over the past five or eight years. And you can, if you notice, for the health career, uh, they definitely went above and beyond at Crystal River, and Lacanta School of Art had so many that they could open up two sections of income and freshmen. Um, so a real testament, like I said, to all the special academic program coordinators at the different schools. Going into next year, uh, we have done several things to monitor this. We have a database of all the students that are in the class of 2025, and we'll be monitoring that each year as they go through high school, so we're able to track what type of attrition, attrition rates over four years, and that'll also give us early warning signs so that we can offer supports to those special programs as needed. We have a common application portal, and this will allow us every year from now on to see how many kids are applying uh, to each of, let me go back real quick, so I can go to, for example, if next year AES only has 100 kids apply, we can go back and kind of see what's going on, what can we do to better support those schools. And finally, uh, I've already had a preliminary conversation with Mrs. Blair. Uh, Mrs. Burdett is on board to help pay for some of the cost to make a professional video of each program so that we can have it at the district uh, level. And next year when we reach out to all the students, we plan to go back to in-person. I feel that is much stronger, better. But at the same time, we plan to also augment with the webinar because there are some families who just can't make it, make that drive, and this will give them another way to find out more about our students. Um, it is not perfect, we can always improve, and it is important to me that we reach every member of the community to let them know all the great things our special academic programs have to offer. Derek, can you go back to the slide that shows the numbers? I think that's what we want to focus on this year too, is in a year, with, uh, without being able to do a lot face-to-face, -face, our numbers are actually higher than the historic range. Uh, and, and so apparently the message got out to uh, the parents and the students. I, I the thank job. you, Mr. Mullen. That's remarkable. I mean, that is truly remarkable. And I think if you looked at the last couple of years prior to that, it was, it was ticking down a little bit. 
And that was the, my only question. So you, you mentioned on the next slide, in person. Well, next slide, okay. Um, offer in-person outreach to students and parents. Do we know, are you, and you may not be ready to talk about that right now, but what that might look like? <laughs> we, um, I like to have a lot of the conversation driven by those people that are helping me out, these um, right here, those mm -hmm. seven individuals. Um, but if we, the preliminary idea is to continue to go back to the four middle schools, each of the pr program coordinators be able to present there. At each of the high schools, we'll have a meeting a night, one, three, three times during the week, one at each high school, so that parents, if they're zoned for that high school, can have an easier way to get there. Um, and then, as we said before, we're gonna have a district social media. So in person, it's similar to what we've done in the past, but perhaps some tweaks, because the, the program coordinators felt that having all the people together in one group, being able to talk to them and they could hear every program, even if they just came to learn about uh, health careers, but then they could hear about the Campus School of Art, being exposed to everything in one sitting was a benefit to them. I definitely agree because the two complaints that I had dealt with that, what you just said about zoned for that school, that mm -hmm. there was a misconception right. that they have to be zoned for that school to be able to go to that academy, and that's not the case. Right. So, you know, I mean, uh, this is, the numbers look good, uh, but we obviously want everyone to know what the opportunities are. I would tell you this, even in elementary school, when I talk, you know, I've, I've got to go to a couple of SAC committees at elementary schools that have kids on them, you know, and I tell them about, you know, I try to pitch them the AES. It seems like a lot of people already know about AES, but you know, I tell them I got a computer science academy at Central High School. It's like, light bulb goes off, you know, for elementary. Now I'm talking about young kids, right? right? But I try to do that and say, hey, look at these options that you're going to have. Look at the opportunities that you may have. So I don't know, you're going to do videos, you're going to do things like that. It'd be really cool to highlight something at maybe the fifth grade level, um, you know, say, hey, you're going to middle school, and guess what? You're not only got that to look forward to, but look then a step further with what you may be able to do in high school. It might be kind of exciting for them um, to see what their options are. Like even in elementary school. No, I like that idea. I hadn't really thought about that, but I'm going to talk to Ms. Gale because what we can do. Mr. Dodd, you're so right, because what happens is that, and, and I start talking to a lot of them in their, their sixth grade year, and we'll yeah. say to parents, you can't, you've got to start having these conversations right. now, That's right. because that eighth grade year starts, and they kind of need a plan. The other one I say, and I know you've talked about this, apply to all of them. If they look interesting to you, apply to all of them and get your options because as you said Mr. Dodd, we're choice we want to let those kids know we're happy to accommodate them we even have transportational options for these kids um, something though that we used to do and I, I want to protect instructional time but we used to and, and you you did it um, the health academy did AES did they would go out and the students would spend time in the classes so that the students kind of could get bought into those programs. Because that one night, the parents kind of can get excited. But the kids, by then, they need to have already been excited. So whether, like you're saying, that's a, an elementary and maybe reinforced in middle school. And, and, I, and I think the reason we had to change that somewhat was because instructional time and, and the limitations of that. So I appreciate that, but if there's a way to, to reincorporate some of those opportunities, I know from my own children who did uh, go to ch these choice programs, it was because they had students come in to their science class and, and talk to them about the exciting things they would be doing. And that carried them to say, I want to apply. Like the attitude, Derek, that you gave to a moment ago for the people that uh, were not perfect. There's always room to improve. Right. And I said, hey, it's pretty good. It's good improve. <laughs> so the attitude says a whole lot. And Derek, the data that I know you're tracking is going to be so valuable to us to know, do we need to tweak something? Do we need to improve a pathway somewhere? Do we need to? Do we need to? So that data, I know um, we kind of were doing it, you know, internally at each of those programs, but to now have the district be able to say, 
is this program working? You know, do we need to be looking at staffing opportunities at, at once? Um, that's invaluable. So, I mean, outstanding job, truly outstanding. Well, and the data too for me would be how many of the students in the Lakanto School of the Arts, the Art Academy, were zoned for Lakanto? How many were zoned mm -hmm. for Crystal River? How many were zoned for Emerus? Then we can get a, we can get a picture too with how many kids in Emerus know about the, the Art Academy, right? Because a lot of them are applying, and you know, they're, I mean, that's an option for them. So I, I, that'd be an interesting data point. That's a good point. Okay. Yeah, I, I will kind of express a, a desire to back you up on the visits because when Judy Powell was running the Health Academy at, mm -hmm. uh, a long time ago, she visited with her kids to all of the middle schools and made arrangements with the teachers to kind of handpick kids to, to really encourage them to participate. And it worked. Yes. Um, so taking, taking the kids and the teacher into the classrooms and I, I think fifth grade is, <laughs> I think fifth grade is not mm -hmm. too, not too early. No, I like that idea. Yeah. I think going to the middle school would be very beneficial. Yeah. Get them thinking in the right. And that correlates with some of like the high school directions conversations that we're talking about of, you know, they we kind of keep talking about it. It's got to backwards plan this. Mm -hmm. And this is that direction. Just, yeah. Derek, would you say with the exception of AES, uh, most of the students from the academies will come from that base school, from students that want to stay. Uh, Correct. There are students from all three high schools in each academy, but the majority of students in those programs come from the base school that's housing, mm -hmm. that's hosting the program. I'd say it's about a two-thirds split. Two-thirds are zoned there, ones are coming from out. Yeah. And, and the new EMS program is in the, in the numbers with the Health Academy? Yes. I know, Derek, one reason that we used to do visits all the time uh, to different schools, but they said that, hey, there's no more money for the buses. But I think now, with the funds that we're getting in, I think there would be money for buses to do something like that. Right. Yes. So I'll be glad when COVID's totally gone and we can get back to <laughs> Any other questions? Great job. Good job. Thanks, Thank sir. you all. Thank you, Derek. Next we have Scott. Are you there? are you going to present next? Yeah. Okay. The board's approval for the contract. Let me get this up. The board's approval for iReady purchases for the 2021-2022 school year. I have Ms. Johnson in the in the um, audience. If you have questions, I'm going to go ahead and just make a motion to approve the iReady purchase for the 2021-2022 school year. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kennedy, second by Ms. Bryant, to approve the This counts. Uh, this counts. So I'm sorry. Uh, next, by the way, guys, next time we'll be sitting. No, no, we'll be sitting. Oh, we'll be able to sit. Yeah, and you can see people. No? Uh, but anyhow, approval of the IRA purchase for 2021-2022 school year. I got a question. Okay, question. Um, yes. So um, in regards to this, uh, you know, it's a big expense, right? Four hundred thirteen thousand um, dollars, and I just wanted to just wanted to hear a little bit about uh, the success uh, of iReady. I mean, I've had a lot of good response. I have had some bad, you know, some some bad comments too. But I, I just wanted to get, you know, um, it, you know how effective and what a, a, a strong program it is. This is. Um, a license that is only good, let's see, how long is this license good for? For a year. For a year, right. So we're, I mean, this is a lot of money that the district spends each year. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to, you know, if we look at third grade literacy, I mean, are we, have we had any um, uh, statistics or data that shows the success of IRAD, I guess? I mean, can you talk about that a little bit? So just to give you a little bit of background on iReady, when I first came to Title I, we were using SuccessMaker. And as you know, our math scores were, were declining year after year after year. So when we looked at that, we decided, you know what, SuccessMaker is not yep. doing the job that we need. So we went to iReady. And iReady, we, in for, for the $413,000, we pay for reading and math, individualized instruction for each student, elementary student, it also pays for three days worth of PD, 
for every school. And it also, we purchase um, the maps books for our students in math. Last year we purchased the last, but due to the um, ELA adoption, we did not purchase those this year because we need to focus in on the instructional materials that we have adopted. So um, we have seen good results from um, iReady in that um, we see growth for our <coughs> students each and every year. Unfortunately, last year was the first year that we adopted iReady, so therefore we did not have FSA results to see if the correlation between iReady and FSA was um, correlating. And so it'll be this year once the results come out, if there's a correlation, and as you, go ahead. No, was there a couple schools that had used it before last year or not, no? There was a pilot at middle schools, but oh, not at school. the elementary level. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. I, I, I remembered something that we kind of <coughs> there, but okay, that was for the middle school. But I think in the state, there is data that shows that there was, I mean, there's a huge there success is. between the two. So Citrus, while we did not, we were not the first district, we actually were probably a later adopter of iReady than some of the others. And that's not a criticism to us, it's just we had success maker, we, you know, we've been kind of had it embedded into our system and iReady, we, we kind of transitioned to it. Yeah, when we came on board, there were only three counties in the entire state that did not use not iReady and we were one of them. And the nice thing about iReady is that they communicate with the state, so any data that needs to be uploaded to the state, they automatically do it for us. So for all of these um, federal grants that we're getting, through ESSER funds and through the Reading Curriculum Grant, iReady sends that data directly to the state for us. When we, um, we look at this coming year, the thing I know that it seems like everyone's talking about is learning gaps. Mm -hmm. And how are we measuring them? What are we doing to address them? And do we have a tool to accomplish that? Because we don't have the state assessments as, you know, I'm not a big assessment fan, especially state assessments, but they do serve a valuable, um, important role. And when we don't have that, we better have these types of tools. How is iReady, as far as our toolbox, both at the district level for monitoring that, and then also right down to the classroom level, how, how is iReady, what role is iReady playing in that learning gap? Well, as you know, it has three diagnostics, the spring, the winter, I'm sorry, the fall, the winter, and the spring diagnostics. So you're able to, um, from the district level as well as from the school level and the teacher level, you can monitor the growth in between. As well as there is it's what's called growth monitoring. So when we don't have a diagnostic in the months that we don't have diagnostics, we have growth monitoring. So that allows us to monitor the students from basically every six to eight weeks we're able to monitor them because you, you have to allow 30 days in between um, um, diagnostics right. and growth monitoring. So about every 30, 60, six to eight weeks we, we are able to monitor them. Also, iReady provides what's called standards mastery, which allows us to monitor students on specific standards. So if we want to know if, if through a school or through the district, if we're weak in a certain area, a certain standard, we are absolutely able to monitor that um, through standards mastery. And then, of course, there's the toolbox for reading and math, where if a teacher sees that my class is not doing well on this standard, they're able to go to the toolbox and pull the exact resources they need to address that standard deficiency. Wow. And it does, I'm assuming, and I, I know the answer to this, but it does work with our hardware, and in this case, I'd say our, our student, you know, one-to-one -one devices. I'm sure that if it did not, Kathy Andrasky would let me know right away. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I have for the 11 elementary schools as, as SAC schools, and I have never heard a negative comment about the iReady. Um, in fact, this year during COVID, they were kind of bragging on that growth management on those tests because the kids saw that they were improving from August to December, they're, they're, they were improving. And we learned that, well, they weren't so far behind in math that we thought they were. Uh, so I've never heard a bad comment about this at all. I think that. And, and I would just say, in fairness to what Mr. Dodd was saying, listen, when we had Compass, for those of you who remember oh, Compass, <laughs> and when we had Success Maker, and, and like I already, I hear those same things. I, I mean, I think that, I think all of our tools are, are gonna, there's not gonna always be 100%, but 
of saying this is the greatest thing, and, and uh, whether it's it's new or different, whether it is if not maybe used to fidelity, all of those will be factors. And so I I, I do respect that feedback because I, I think it's it's understandable. Well, and then with the parent side of it, because the parents they sure. can log in to see their child's progress, right? But they can't. Uh, explain the parent how the parent is involved. Right. The parents it. can af can can uh, monitor their students' progress, but we do not want our students doing iReady at home. Right. Because we want the path that the student begins with diagnostic one, we want that to stay true to what they're capable of. And as much as we want parents to help them and be successful at home, we don't want right. that when they're on their own path. We want them to struggle a little bit and be able to be able to set the path. Whereas success them. maker allowed for some No, we did not do success maker at home either. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well that that was one of the the, the the concerns about how parents can help their yeah. kids, but they, they, I understand they can still see their child's progress, right? But they, there's nothing they can do to really engage their child with I ready, right? Right, and, yeah. and, and that was that was so um, important, especially through COVID, when they when the students were taking the diagnostic. That was so important that we had our students that um, were virtual come in and take the diagnostics because it is so important that that path stay true to the student's abilities. Right. Yeah, again, I just, I, I like to have discussion. We're talking about, you know, this amount of money every year. I mean, you know, I, I like to, you know, just highlight that. Um, so, you know, we're, we want to do what's what's best for our kids and the best chance to succeed. And I, you know, it's good just to have that. Yeah, and I broke that down for you, Mr. Dodd, and that comes out to $61.46 per child. And I think that that, <laughs> <laughs> that is a great expenditure per child for all that they get <clears throat> for the money. For all that we get. All that we get, yes. <coughs> so then, are we ready to vote then? Are we ready for a vote? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, all in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Opposed? Carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this is the Mosola for next. Mr. Mullen. I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> you definitely drew the, the short straw. Yeah. <laughs> the first thing she wanted me to go over with is the, uh, the uh, investments. Here, did you need? Yeah. Thank you, sir. And to let you know that April was not a good month in the investment area, but I'm sure you all are well aware of that. Uh, but things are picking back up in May. And before you get excited about the total, I want to remind you that this was as of April 30th. We do double payrolls in May, double payrolls in June. So a lot of that money is uh, it just hasn't been spent yet. It's going to be spent, huh? Yes, ma'am. Are you, uh, she also provided you a copy of the uh, final budget with a comparison of uh, last year's so that you can see the uh, revenue increase in total. Total new money is about $810,000. I'll uh, go back to the signage. Oh, I'm sorry. Have we skipped over that? Yeah. Were there questions about the signage, Mr. Bishop? I think that's your comment. I'm sorry? The signage. Signage. Yeah, we, it's in here it says renew. Sarasota piggyback. Piggyback. Renew Sarasota the bid, so we can vote to renew. Was, did somebody have questions? Yes, about I had a question. Uh, my question was about the uh, electronic signs at, I think there were three or four schools that they weren't functioning, and we talked about this last meeting, we're not yes. using SAC money to... We're still chasing that down. We'll be prepared to change the next board meeting. Okay, we'll but is this $8,000, could that be used to help repair some of these signs? Um, is that, uh, I don't know what the sign is, is, uh, is for, um, the $8,000 signage capital funds. I was kind of hoping that if we needed to increase that to, in order to have our electronic signs at our schools. This, is the kind of so. this isn't the kind of signs that you're talking about. This isn't the electronic signs. I think these are the signs that maintenance uses them. 
speaking for Mr. Like Richard. exit signs and yeah. fire we, we, we make all kinds of signs across the district, uh, in-house, in actually. And these are not for the schools, then, like uh, Hernando it's Elementary. Like like digital signs? Yeah. We don't have any budget for that as of right now, no man. Okay. Yeah. We're talking about this contract. What is this bid for? for your so this, ca signs? this is a capital fund signage. Uh, so I thought this was like bigger so items. I didn't think they were like little bitty. Like uh, I didn't think they were like exit signs. And, uh, well, it'd be, you know, there's a lot of signs that they put on the doors, like the, these exit 101A signs, the braille signs that they have to put on the doors. What else do you all do with those? Um, yeah, names like, uh, for example, if we're going to name a, a room, for say mechanical room, what have you, we'll make that sign in town okay. We'll do that ourselves. Yeah, but this is for a bid, though, Johnny. Yeah, this, this is for, for, for this is for a company. For the, uh, I'm not, to be quite honest with you, I'm not well versed. Being out of town, I haven't, I haven't looked at it. If you want us to shelve it, we'll shelve them. Right no, I, I don't want you. To, I don't need it to be shelved. But I it's definitely not for electronic it. signs. I, I don't right. know. I tell you that. My concern was I, I wanted to talk about the electronic signs and I was hoping that this was the avenue to... Uh, You'd like to, to find some money you know, out I mean, there with electronic signs, wouldn't yeah. you? Um, yeah. Mr. John, I, I, I don't, I'm on the, kind of the same page about your concern on the digital signs. Yeah. Maybe that's something we could put on a workshop that we could just, you know, Absolutely. talk about which ones we have, what's working, and you know, their doing, functions. That's what we're doing right now. I have staff out trying to find out what models do we have? Can we still buy a parts for them? Because some of them may be out of digital working by parts for them. So For sure, middle school's been broken for a long yes, time. Yes, ma'am. You made that clear last time, and uh, so we, we do know that. And so okay. we'll, we'll bring that right, so in. Just, I, I will tell you, just I, I know it hasn't gotten cheaper since I was doing that a few years ago, but I'm one sure. sign repair was $30,000 okay. at McCanto High School one year. Okay. And, that, and that sign lasted a month, got hit with lightning again, and was out. So. Uh, the electronic signs are very costly. I think Mr. Bishop will share that. Absolutely, and there's you know the signs that we have. Schools have made decisions to go out and uh, put the <coughs> on the funds. I'm not saying we should not support them. I would just say that if we were to do that, I would it be my suggestion that we have to come up with a, a, a process where all schools have that have access to that type of sign. You know, um, for example, there's primary school signs out right now. We know the last time we got the price score on fixing that was about fifty-five hundred dollars. We don't have that budget, we don't have that money, but other schools chose not to have a sign so they wouldn't be in that situation. If, if our position has changed, I'm good with that. But I just want to make sure we have a long-range plan where we can phase those things in and be equitable for everybody. Got it. So, so you're going to put that on the workshop. Yeah, and, well, I will make that a workshop item. And what's here is what you're talking about, like the extra signs and the small signs. So that's it's just what whatever sign that they need that they have to have under contract. They're just a, Got it. And it could be anything. It could be uh, a name sign on the door. It could be anything. Well, then did we get a motion on uh, yeah, there wasn't adopting specific this specific in the bid. It just said signage. signage. It didn't say yeah. what kind of sign. I think that's... But we'll see if the board has any hesitation. I, I don't mind you to, to table it. We'll bring it back. Is well, this something we have done in the past? Yeah, we're just yes. renewing we're the rebid. That's what I thought. So, yeah. so. Why don't we bring it back? Because the thing that throws me is the capital funds on signage. I mean... You know, there's a certain amount of dollars to be a capital expense, right? But if you're so, going to piggy bank on Sarasota and their bid, they may be going ahead with theirs. It doesn't matter. We can, no, so we, we can join it. We can join it. We can join it. There. It doesn't matter. All right. Okay, so you want to... I'll right, make just a table. table. Uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, I just want to say, if you guys want to table right. it, we'll be more glad to bring it back. All right, I'll make a motion that we table um, the renewal of bid 2018-01P signage. Uh, provide and install piggyback service out of schools bid 17 0203. Okay. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Mr. Dodd, a second by Mr. Kennedy uh, to table the renewal of the bid of uh, sign, signage. Madam, Madam Chair, uh -huh. I would like to uh, include in that table until the next meeting. Is that right? Yeah, when you table it, that it'll, it, 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 it must go to the next meeting. Right, but it won't go to the workshop. It'll go to the. It technically has to go to vote. If you t if you vote to table, it goes to the next, next meeting. Unless uh, I think Mr. Bradshaw for clarification. Yeah. Even yeah. this is not a even this is a workshop meeting, and so it's a special meeting. It's just you yeah. just have to bring it as a special meeting. Okay, I'm good with that. And we'll yeah. have one for personal transactions anyway. So okay. Yep. Yeah. This time of year, we have to have. Yeah. We'll be yeah. Okay. Thank you. Therefore, all in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed? 
carries five zero. Thank Madam you. Madam Chair, though, just on that, because I, I appreciate Mr. Bishop that you're doing the kind of the inventory and the check and the signs. Is and I don't know if it's if it's still possible, but one of the things I think that we need to look at in the future, and maybe it helps us to know what we're doing now, is there isn't a I don't know that there's a funding so that source that you know. PTA or SAC, you know, well-meaning, they purchase the sign, but that doesn't help us with the, the upkeep. The that's been a, and the maintenance, that's been a, an issue we dealt with with technology in the past, that we have the funds to purchase the item, but then when it breaks down, there's no funding. And so just approving an item, we're gonna have to, I think, take into consideration, will there be funding for that? Right, well, it, I, I liken it to very similar for our school boards. In our athletic arenas, you know, for mm -hmm. years, uh, so do many companies will pay for those uh, repairs and new, and new uh, school boards, but we couldn't do that any longer because we don't sell the volume of uh, product. So now what we have to do every year is we budget, a line item in our capital budget, we put X number of dollars in there for school boards, school board replacement, school board uh, repairs. So if it is the will of the board to go down the road of bringing, of putting electro electronic signs, I would say, then we'd have to put a line item every year out of our capital budget for maintenance and upkeep of those signs. And you researched that to see how much that would be if we put a line item in? Yeah, we, yeah, we, we could uh, find out a, an approximation. We just have to put a number in the budget, right. but we'd make it a well-informed number based on market price right now for signage and parts. But I think you're gonna find some of those signs it's cheaper to start over start because mm -hmm. they're, the technology's outdated. It's like trying to fix an Apple IIe computer. I mean, we could probably find the parts, but we're going to pay dearly. Wow, you even know that. <laughs> That's actually <laughs> impressive. So, I mean, and I just think of the one at Lacanto when, when uh, the maintenance was one of my departments quite a few years ago, we we had a hard time finding the parts to fix that. It took us almost three months, and finally we got somebody to build the part to fix the technology. In it. So I think it's the same case now. And they're very susceptible to... Well, any electronics are that we use. They're very susceptible to electrical storms, which we get one or two in the summer times. So and am I correct? Four, None of our sports signs, thankfully, are digital signs. Or none of our sports, our scoreboards, have digital signs. And when I mean digital, I mean where they're like out front, where they're just a large digital LED. It might be in the, in the yeah, chat. We have LED bulbs, but as far as digital, I mean like a, like a jumbotron? Right. Think, no, we don't have that. That's what I was going to say. I didn't think we did. I mean, it. yeah, the LED bulbs are, are different, but uh, I was thinking specifically, yeah, Mike, I was thinking outside, not um, Mr. Mom, not no. inside, but yeah. yeah. Mr. Dodd, did you have another question? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It sounds like we're all probably on the same thing. I just page. want to make sure I'm clear. We're tabling the, uh, the signage piece. We'll uh, we bring that back at the next meeting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Special okay. meeting. And we'll also, at the upcoming workshop, we'll have information about the digital signs. Okay. On the digital signs that are in front of some of our high schools, like the Lacanto Complex, you know, they have the happy birthday thing and stuff like that. I wonder, since Sodium just gave our educational foundation 25000 can we get PTA to go get sponsors for this sign? And Somebody. every once in a while, just say, this sign sponsored by whatever that company is, and it's like yeah, advertising. It's usually not. It's the, the easy part is getting is getting the money one time to buy the sign. The hard part is keeping the sign going because they yeah. are they're very uh, maintenance they, they, heavy. They, I mean, they, but they would they pay X amount of dollars into the capital fund for that particular sign or something like that to so get their name across <laughs> the ribbon. We, we, we can do all Just that like stuff, but it gets very, it gets very complicated. Transit buses and things caution, like that. I would caution the board uh, on that because keep in mind, if we're out going out getting, trying to raise funds for maintenance of our digital sign, that's less money. Those those same donors usually are going to yeah. put into our swim teams, our football yeah. teams. Or, yeah. there's, yeah. Only so, there's only so much money in the community to go around. To well, how about WTC? I mean, the students there, could they be trained to monitor, monitor the sign? Ooh. I don't know if that's uh, one of their... Uh, skill I levels or not. I think I they're know. good in, in uh, many things, such as that, like for the home. So may, maybe we can ask. We can ask a question. Good questions for the for the workshop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anything else before we return to Mr. Bolland, who was uh, giving us a synopsis on the monies?
Mr. So what we're, what, where we left off, I was telling you that uh, Ms. Wilson prepared the uh, final conference report and compared it, second calculation, fourth calculation, and the final conference report from 2021, and then uh, gave you a column where the differences are. And the one that you may be most interested to, if you just jump down to the bottom, is total funding. And your total new funding is from last year to this year is about $810,418. So, uh, yes, they raised the FEFP, but you can look down at the class size and see that they took money out of the class size uh, categorical. So, uh, money's added and money's taken away. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Which is, you know, we're used to that every year. Yep. So basically we got the $82.08 more per student in FTE, right? Is that unweighted. I'm sorry, an unweighted FTE, yes. Thank you. And I think we just have to, and I know all of us are, are cognizant of it, but this state budget, while I'm so appreciative of, was largely impacted positively because of the federal influx of the the money out of Washington and I'm grateful that our students are going to be in a little better position than we are this year but we cannot depend on that money sure. being there and we've got to you know realize that it could be a, a much more challenging budget session next year so the, that leads into the next sheet is <laughs> where, the, where we're at with the uh, ESSER one the CARES money uh, we have hopefully we'll have that spent down uh, to zero by the end of June. Just a shell. I'm good at that. And then we, uh, as Miss Wilson told you in the last board meeting, we have the Esser two money, <laughs> which we have. Uh, I think she gave you a breakdown of that, but if she did. I'll include that for your information too on how that money is broken down. And what's of specific interest to us is the $7 million item where we have to have that uh, spent by September 1st. So they're going back and trying to cut. We can cost that back to March of 2020, and that's what they're working on now in finance. But we can't do that until we get rid of all the S or one. Uh, and you're right, that's a good problem to have, but as Mr. Kennedy pointed out, uh, when it's gone, it's gone. And it's not reoccurring. Uh, she did want me to point out to you that the S or two money cannot be used for bonuses. Uh, there's a lot of questions about that because the governor's going to be paying out bonuses to uh, teachers that's coming out of the ESSER 3 money. And uh, the way it stands right now, we're told that that will come directly from the state. We will verify, the list, the, yeah, verify those that are eligible. What that eligibility status is, we don't know. But will the state actually send a check directly to the... That's what we're told. Yeah, they said they're going to send a paper check to every... They're spending millions of dollars to track every teacher's and address and stuff like that, and a paper check's going to be sent directly to the teacher. So something we just need to be thinking about is, uh, you know, in the past, this the employee is sometimes still obligated to the federal withholdings, and that may be a conversation we just have to uh, yeah, I don't monitor. know how they're. I don't know how because if they're doing it when they do it to us, then we usually are mandated to withhold that. But if it's coming from the state, they probably don't have the means to do that, and that may be something that, uh, that they we just have to be yeah. cognizant of if there's some communication later on. It is taxable. How much? How much money? That's going to be interesting. We are working on uh, identifying the uh, $7 million that we have to have spent by September, going back and trying to cost certain things to that. Uh, that, that meet eligibility requirements that we think meet eligibility requirements. We've yet to have a webinar on that from DOE. Uh, they keep promising there's going to be a webinar. At this point, we're told to spend the money, draw down the money, and then uh, ask for approval for what you spend it on after the fact. So that makes us, 
as comfortable as. as uh, <laughs> That's tough, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it is. Having gone through multiple audits in my lifetime, I will tell you that that's just a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Because some auditor is going to sit across the table from us and tell us that he doesn't agree with that. Uh, probably three years from now, but it'll still happen. So, so the data informed supports gear money is going to fund the salary benefits and extra duty for a data scientist. We've been doing that, Mr. Dunn. That's in the research and accountability teacher on assignment up there. But now, is that this, which which yeah, sheet yeah, I'm talking about, about the fine print? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so we're able to pay that salary. That's that money came with that strict <laughs> intention that it had to be for a data uh, somebody to use to track the data for students, and that's what that person is doing. So yeah. as we brought in a tote. We, well, there's a tow cell. Correct. That's new for that position. Well. We, we, we took a toaster that we're, was, was in Ed Services and moved them into that role, and we're funding them through that, through that money. And when that money's gone, then we can choose to keep that person at, with the oper using our operating dollars or send that person back to what they were doing. Is that correct, Dr. Hugh? Yes, that is correct. <laughs> but when they get, some of this money, when they give it to us, it's with a specific intent. Yep. And that's going to be the case with a lot of things that we're doing in, in the uh, recovery of the, uh, the learning gaps that have occurred through, through uh, the coronavirus. So the question is, what happens when all this money goes? What are we going to do for these programs that we're adding a lot of these remediation programs? The hope is that we've closed that learning gap and that we won't need those programs. Including so that is one year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't my plan. <laughs> but uh, yes, you're right. All right. But it's... Uh, but that's the intent. And then there's CARES or ESSER 3 money coming. We don't know what that total is, but that's the money that uh, the governor is paying the bonuses out of. We are continuing to work on the budget right now. We don't have a budget picture for you. As I said, the, the, the governor just signed the budget, so finance is working diligently to try to uh, cost things either to the ESSER 1 or the ESSER 2. And by doing that, that will improve our fund balance moving forward to next year, uh, things that we were paying for out of the general fund. Okay. Clear as mud. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, guys, for Mr. Butler? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have uh, Attorney Legal Matters. No, ma'am. Let me mention to you, however, when we were down in Tampa, uh, some people were having a discussion on shall and will as it's used in the law. Okay. <laughs> and I immediately thought of you. <laughs> okay. Uh, May I have a motion to approve the minutes of April 27th? Move approval of item 11A and B. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kennedy, seconded by Mr. Dodd, to approve items 11A and B. No, yeah, yeah, that's right. But do I have uh, a vote for a ready vote? Mm -hmm. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Could we not do that, Lisa? No, she was just saying it's 21. Okay. No. Okay, moving on. And do we need to put that on motion? Yeah, a motion. Change of motion. Okay. To, oh, 21. I'm sorry. I, 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 I meant my motion to be 21 A and B. Thank you, Mr. Dodd. Second also. Okay, and then we need another vote. <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Jose. Carries by zero. Thank you. And now, citizens' comments. Where are the citizens? Do we have any citizens' comments? Okay. All right. Uh, any other business that needs to come before the board? Madam Chair, before we go into the individual board members' comments, um, the business before the board would deal with our meetings uh, and the schedule for this month and next month for our meetings. Yes. Because this is actually, tomorrow will be the third uh, the third Tuesday of June, but we waited until we had the 28 days, which was today. So that means 
is there a workshop scheduled for next Tuesday, the 22nd, or do we go right to our July uh, 13th, 13th meeting? It wasn't. So we what? didn't have one scheduled for June. I didn't think we did, but I, I didn't have it on my calendar, but I didn't know if that was... So we then go to July, July, is that correct? July 13th. So the, the table item could go July 13th? Correct. Yes. July 13th? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So July 13th will be our next uh, scheduled meeting, and then will we have, do we have a workshop scheduled in July? Yes, that's all. On the 27th. 27th, okay. That's all I have. I just wanted to. Oh, thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mr. Kennedy, do you have anything you'd like to? Um, yeah, um, I wanted to just welcome our new um, correspondent, uh, educational correspondent from the Chronicle, Hannah Sakowitz. Hannah, if you don't know, was a uh, elementary student at Citrus Springs Elementary, Central Ridge. Uh, Citrus Springs Middle and was part of the Lecanto IB program and so she is one of our own and uh, another that we have raised so I'm grateful to, uh, to her input in being here. I, I just have to reach out. I've, I've shared about this previously but I want to say once again thank you to all those that have been involved in the senior awards uh, this last month, and especially the graduations. And I know he hates to hear it, but Mr. Bishop, I just have to again publicly thank you for your work on the graduations. I know that you spent months working towards that success, and uh, many times when we were sitting there, I looked over and he was, of course, worrying about everything to make sure it was still going right. But um, you know as a parent how grateful I am to you and as a board member. And I know that these staff members are so grateful that, uh, one, they got to take that mask off. But we had, you know, 100% occupancy controlled. And I'm grateful to you. So thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Um, student progression plan meeting I had today was the last final meeting I attended for us and I wanted you to know that all of your updates and revisions um, passed unanimously in the end and um, they uh, great work everyone that contributed to that over and over um, they commented of uh, school board input uh, as part of that incorporation and I wanted to thank everyone for attending the Florida School Board Association conference and training it was so amazing to be back together. You know, we, like so many others, spent the last year doing a lot of our work uh, through Zoom, um, whether that's committee work, uh, whether that's Ms. Bryant and the board of directors, uh, as well as on um, the Flo uh, Florida School Board Insurance Trust, as well as advocacy, Ms. Powers. And, um, but being back together, uh, we're so grateful, and, and I just want to thank each of you. Miss Counts, you always are such a joy to the way you are so supportive of, of us in when we each have something going on. You are there to not just support us, but you are helpful being able to then get feedback and input on, uh, on the work of the State Association. And again, it was great to be back. There is some exciting uh, work that is happening and I know we're going to be sharing more about that as in the future. So thank you. That's it. I'm not her. Okay. Mr. Dove. Well, um, it was nice to see us on the consent agenda item 17U, the boardroom equipment for <laughs> new microphones <laughs> and TVs and screen and all those great things. Um, you know, I did talk uh, with Kathy and Lance to kind of get a rundown of what, what they're going to do. Um, and, um, you know, I, I also mentioned that, boy, it'd be nice if we're going to do all this. I mean, the boardroom's going to look different. Wouldn't it be great if we had our, our logo up here? So the Kennedy School District logo, like almost all other districts do. And we, you know, we can still put the state logo right here. That, that would be fine with me. But I think when we do this nice big update, and things are going to change with uh, big, what, 72-inch screens here and, and screens up here and the ceiling that we're going to be looking at. And I, I understand they're going to take away or getting rid of all these screens that we have here. 
Um, so, you know, this room's going to look different, but um, I just thought that would be kind of nice. And it did, we, it, it also had the microphones in there too, didn't it, yes. Kathy? So that they could hear better when we do yes. on, when our, our camera and, and uh, video kind of syncs a little better. So I was glad of that. Uh, I see that, uh, I think we're doing Guardian training uh, this week. Uh, I know Dave, Dave Vincent's in there. And uh, so I just, uh, you know, am glad to know that it looked like we had um, a, a good number of applicants for those positions. And uh, um, I was just kind of curious on the news of that, Chief Vincent, if you wanted to uh, just give me a rundown real quick with where we are with Guardians. <laughs> no. oh, that, so. Yeah. so I'm just glad that that's okay. Kathy's part just started, <laughs> stopped and started again. Uh, so good evening. Just a quick update on the Guardian training. We did. Uh, we screened. Uh, I think there was 11 applicants through that. We ended up selecting four applicants that made it through the the background and screening process, uh, both with the district and the sheriff's office. Uh, they started their training last Wednesday. Uh, they're working a a modified schedule. It's uh, three days during the week and one day on the weekend uh, just because of the staffing uh, to get that training done uh, through the sheriff's office. So uh, they'll complete June 28th, I believe is their last day of their training. So they'll be uh, completed with that and we were able to get all of that accomplished in the, the timeline to have the grant cover that because the state did come back and say that there was grant funding um, back in play. So, uh, but it had to be spent by June 30th. So we were able to accomplish all the background screening and training before June 30th, so they'll be completed June uh, 28th, and we'll have four substitute guardians that we'll be able to pick from in this following year as we have vacancies if they, if they arise. So, okay, uh, going going very well. And uh, we just also did our, our guardian retraining last week for our current guys uh, out there. Uh, they did all of their firearms, defensive tactics, and legal updates last week. And the retraining is what we do, right? The sheriff doesn't have to retrain, or does the sheriff? No, the sheriff has to retrain. Oh, the sheriff is the retrainer yeah. also. Okay. Yeah, the, the statute still reads it. Uh, the recertification of the guardian. That's the sure. Okay, okay, good. Um, and then you have Alice instructor training coming up. I know that from being on the safety and security committee. We do. Um, yeah, and next Monday we're hosting it. Uh, it was open to anyone. Uh, we have uh, several school districts represented. I believe the furthest one is Swanee County uh, coming to uh, participate in that uh, training. So we had the last check was 16 people attending the Alice instructor. Uh, four of them are from our district and the other 12 are from other Districts and agencies, police agencies. And I know uh, we answered some emails. I, I mean, we've gotten on the same page. But the Alice training and the drills are going to be an integral part continuing forward um, in our district. And uh, I appreciate. I know there was one of our teachers, very, um, you know, uh, quality uh, teacher that had reached out. And I, I read the email. You responded. I thought you did a very nice job with that. And you know, we want to communicate. Uh, well with with all of our stakeholders and teachers as we protect our schools but I just want to point that out that you did a great job with that I appreciate it. Um, so thank you um, that's all I have for Dave okay. I have one more item thank you appreciate right. it um, so um, I took over as president of the FHSAA at our meeting last week so I'm uh, in my year as the president all right. and, um, we said so, big things to me. <laughs> yes. So there are some topics, and, and Mr. Bishop, I just wanted to run this by you, but I, I'd kind of like to get some <coughs> input on some things uh, from girls wrestling that we're dealing with to, uh, you know, shot clock in basketball, pitch count process in baseball. So I, I'd kind of <laughs> like to, uh, some of those items that we're dealing with, just to have a little local, uh, more, uh, you know, opinion of our ADs and, and maybe some coaches, but at least the ADs. So I was just wondering about being at, uh, coming to one of the meetings or how, I don't know how much you do this summer with them. Generally not much, but because there are so many different policy changes, I have no problem bringing people together. Okay. Like to do that. Yeah, I, I might, I'll get Give me a call them. tomorrow so I can get your availability and my availability. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah, we can just talk about it. I mean, I, I don't want it to be, uh, you know, I want Try to be convenient for those no, people. But, you know, it's it's going to be good that we have. I have some. You know, shock. I mean, you know, the pitch count just because <laughs> I know you've been. Yeah. We are great. We are very blessed to have Mr. Dodd representing us. Um. So that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Did uh, they already released football? If I recall. Yes. 
Yes, um, reclassification yes, they have. is are the other sports going to be coming soon? Do you know? Or? Uh, the fall sports are done. The winter sports should be soon. I think okay. by the end of the month, I believe. Got it. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Ms. Gales. Well, following up on you, Mr. President, uh, we also had a great meeting face-to-face -face with uh, the State School Board Association. Um, Ginger Bryant was re-elected as Board of Director. Um, Tom, Mr. Kennedy, is our new Vice President. He will be President of the Association. The president-elect. President, your president is Because Vice President is, it, yeah, I was Vice President now, now President and In a elect. year, you will be President of the State Association. And Superintendent Himmel in July will be President and take care of the superintendents in the state. So, Little Old Bay Citrus County is pretty well represented statewide in a lot of very important positions, and I'm so proud. I did, I did the same usual thing. I came back from Tampa driving up that Parkway, going, "Thank God I work in Citrus County um, because we still have some problems across the state." Um, but. Congratulations to, to all of our graduates, and thank you, Johnny, again for pulling off the end of the year so that all those kids could graduate and walk. And I, I think five out of the six speeches I heard all thanked their teachers. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was phenomenal yes. because they realized that we'd gone the extra mile in the classroom for them. So I, I was really encouraged by that. Good kids, good kids. And looking forward to strategic planning here in a couple weeks and talking about reopening in August. Without masks. <laughs> with masks, here, here. with masks optional. Optional. Masks will be optional. If you if you'd like for your child to wear a mask, they certainly they certainly may wear a mask. If you don't want your child to wear a mask, they don't have to. How about that? Good plan. Um, I don't really have that much. Everybody said everything. I had a good time in Tampa. Good. Yeah. Yeah, they did. That's all. And I sort of follows in the steps of Mr. Kennedy. He moved up, and I moved into the spot that he had with it, which is uh, with the legislative uh, agenda. So, mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to that this year. Last year was very difficult to get messages and everything else. You just didn't do it. But uh, with COVID going bye bye, then it'll be easier. And I'm looking forward to it because I do like that. Even since I was in college, I used to be, I worked for the legislature when I was in college. And uh, I, I used to be very interested in it and never lost that interest. So anything that you think of, let me know and I'll bring it up. Appreciate it. And that's all. Anything else from anybody? We stand adjourned. Thank you.